Good morning and welcome to ABC's online service. I'm Phyllis Blackwood Henderson. Um, let's go ahead and worship God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we um, are kind of spread near and far because of the pandemic, but we know that you are here and you meet us where we are figuratively and literally. And so we thank you for that. We welcome you here with us collectively um, and ask that you would um, be over our service today. Thank you for this time that we get to spend with you together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Super Sunday. Game? What game? This is Super Sunday because it's the day we set aside each week when we worship the Lord with our believing family at ABC. And you're part of us. We are meeting uh, apart virtually uh, because of COVID right now. So no one is meeting at the church live. We hope to resume services on February 27th, but that's tentative. The deacons will let you know the week before. In the meantime, uh, the functions of the church are carrying on. Uh, we still maintain our ministries. TLC groups, are some of them are meeting for Bible study by Zoom. Our youth program is continuing and the relationships are a building in spite of the distance uh, through Zoom and telephone contacts. The finance department will meet this week on Thursday and the deacon board the following week. So we are pray for us as we continue to do all of the ministries of ABC without uh, touching each other any more than we have to. And uh, James Harris, my brother, we celebrated your 100th birthday last week, and that was great. But it was your 102nd. We cheated you out of two years, and we're sorry about that. I know they were the best two years of your life. So God bless you, brother, and your whole family on this Super Sunday. Somebody just say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody again just tell the Lord thank you. Thank you. I want you to look at the neighbor beside you and say, I'm so glad you're here. Look on the other side and tell the other neighbor, I'm so glad you're here. Join in and praise the Lord with us. He's worthy of all praise and all the glory. And there's no goodness of our own that we're here today. But we're here to celebrate what God has brought us through and the things that we have overcome. So while we're doing that, let's just lift our hands and give God glory in this place.
Several years ago, a good and faithful member of ABC passed away, Joe Wilson. She had a heart for missions. She really loved all the people of the world. And so in her will, she gave a significant amount of money for the missions program at Altadena Baptist Church. And we've been preserving and very carefully using that money. Shortly before Christmas, the missions committee decided to give a special a kind of encouraging donation to those particular global partners that we have worked with who are touching the lives of children. And so it was decided to give $1,000 each from the funds that Joe Wilson left to enrich the lives, encourage the spirits of children and young people through these five programs. The Adam School in Ghana, that we have supported for many years, witness as ministry with the Bushables in leadership and their work with the children of refugees in the Middle East, Youth for Christ working with teenagers in Barcelona, Spain, and Deborah House, well, home for abused women and children in Tijuana, Mexico, and then Hope Unlimited for children in Brazil, uh, probably our newest partner in ministry. And this money was received by all of them and used to meet their needs and do something special for youth and children. Well, we received a thank you from Hope Unlimited. And here is Corrine Smith telling you how that $1,000 gift was a great encouragement, very timely for them, for the children of Brazil.
So we celebrated the 100th day of school on Tuesday. And I teach second graders. So it's really interesting um, because for seven and eight year olds, anything over 20 is old to them. So we began talking about like, what would somebody 100 years old look like? And they had different ideas and opinions. And then one of my more confident students blurted out, well, you know, like people from the 90s. Excuse me very much. Yeah. So I began, of course, to think about, well, so how do we make black history or the history of uh, black people in America relevant to young people today? And so I'd like to share um, two students, well, two young people that have really uh, made an impact that you may not know about. So Naja Akil, who at 14 fought um, a national rule um, that would change um, the athlete's attire um, and that would allow her to wear um, a hijab. Another um, young person who has done like some fantastic things already is Deja Taylor, who at 17 was honored for creating color changing sutures that detected infection. So it's really important that we, um, of course, talk about the past, but also um, help our young people to be inspired. Um, to feel empowered about um, the contributions that they can make in their day and time, just like people from the 90s. So as we continue to support our church um, and supporting the community and outreach, um, you are welcome to make your um, tithes and offerings online and you can do that at www.altadenabaptist.org forward slash donate. Again, that's www.altadenabaptist.org forward slash donate. Be blessed. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for lifting our eyes beyond our own little world here in Altadena and seeing that there are people all over the world who need you and are being led to you by those who care. We thank you for our global partners that we honor today who work with young people and children in the world. We thank you that so many of our support dollars go to touch the lives of children. And we thank you for the word from Hope Unlimited about what's being done in the lives of the children of Brazil who otherwise would not have hope, let alone unlimited hope. We thank you for our own youth, Lord, and we thank you for the youth focus of today, who is Mary Pomeroy, a young lady who just turned 16 this week, and we praise you for her. We pray that you'll bless her in this time when life seems so abnormal, and help her to have an inner strength that can cope with it all. We pray that you will lead her to strong, healthy friendships, to college and career choices that are the best for her, and that you will give her an inner love for yourself and all people she encounters by your grace. We thank you for the others who share the fellowship of the youth group with her, for Garrison Hunt, who also turned, 16 this week, and for the brightness of his life and the promise of it. All of them, Lord, need your help, and we pray that for them. We pray for those of us who are in the later chapters of our life as well. We pray for those who struggle with illness and are going through loss of life and grief. We pray, thanking you for embracing Monique Mitchell uh, with your everlasting arms as she passed after months of struggle. Bless her family, her son Jonathan, her granddaughter Jaden, for all the people who love her. Bless Bob Lee and Diane as she cares for him and help them to know that they are still loved by this fellowship and especially by you. Bless Nancy Cabrera as she goes through her health journey and and Gordy, as he supports her 
and help them to trust you and find that you do indeed never fail, and that your everlasting arms are beneath them. All of us who are going through difficulties, Lord, we need a special reminder from you today that you are there, and we're asking for that. We pray in our own words the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Heavenly Father, far beyond anything we can imagine, we join all of creation in lifting up your name and showing the respect you deserve. We look forward to the time when the world in which we live is untwisted, when every person and every corner of creation recognizes that you are the world's heartbeat, and when we all get into rhythm with your beat so that we spontaneously do what is right and good under your guidance. In the meantime, Lord, we live lives filled with difficulties and challenges day by day. So, Lord, give us our daily bread, the basic needs of our family. Forgive us for all the ways we have messed up. Please give us the ability to rise above our pettiness and to forgive others when they mess up. And, Lord, please shine your light on the path ahead of us so we don't take steps into darkness. And when we do take wrong steps, help us to find our way back to the path. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. You are the only one who really knows the path. And you are the only one who has the power to keep us from straying from the path. And you are the only one who can restore us to the path. You yourself are the light that constantly shows us the steps ahead. And this will be true of you and of us throughout our lifetime. No. Through the rest of human history. No. Forever. You will lead us into our forever, the path that leads to eternity by your grace through Jesus Christ, who closed the gap between you and us. In his name we pray. Amen. I went to a Christian college, and in our senior year, we had to write a thesis paper. Then we had to defend our paper by standing in front of the class and fielding questions from our classmates who had read our paper. A friend of mine wrote his 40-page paper on prayer. So during the examination, I finally asked, well, what even is prayer? How does it work? And he had no idea what I was talking about. So I fumbled on. We're trying to connect from the mortal, physical, limited, human being to a divine, uncreated, outside of any realm of our ability to grasp and hold, alien, holy God. So how does me thinking or saying words, and sometimes no words at all, directing my attention towards God, how does my attempt at communication, which I know to be so puny, connect? with God who is so complete and perfect in himself. How does prayer work? And he looked at me and he said, what do you mean? Prayer is just talking with God. It wasn't really fair to ask this question in that setting because he really had no clue what I was talking about and I really should have uh, thrown him a softball that he could hit out of the park. But I wasn't trying to trip him up. I've always been curious about that question. What even is prayer? I fumble to this day to express what I mean. For me to communicate with you, something has to pass between us. A sound, words, words on paper, a look, uh, something shared on a device. Something passes between us and we connect. But prayer is connection with the Almighty God. Our human effort to pass something 
between us in order to connect with the divine. We're in a sermon series entitled Created for Worship. And last week, Pastor George described the chasm, the wide, wild, untamable distance between humans and God, and our feeble attempt to bridge that gap with our sacrificial offerings to God, but God ultimately bridging that distance between us with his sacrificial offering to us of his son. Well, prayer also is our attempt to bridge the gap between us and God. If we look at it logically, dispassionately, it's an unbridgeable gap. And there's no way we can engineer the transportation of our thoughts, our words, our wordless longings to be able to reach God. The bridging has to come from God's side. So we can say both things. What even is prayer? It boggles the mind when we stop to think about what we are attempting to do in prayer. And we can also say prayer is simply talking with God. Even a child can understand that. Even a child can connect with God through prayer. And both are true. This is an excellent book on prayer. The Possibility of Prayer, Finding Stillness with God in a Restless World by John Stark. And I'd like to preach a whole raft of sermon just by reading the chapters of this book out loud. So Stark talks about trying to spend 10 minutes in stillness and silence before God and the ensuing busyness and chatter, anxiety, the inner conflicts, the distractions, the half-heartedness that get in the way of that communion time. He talks about trying to find an express lane for prayer so that prayer will be productive and useful and effective as if prayer was a business proposition. And he says, quote, for many, a life of prayer and spiritual depth is not for them. It's not that they do not desire it, it's that they believe it's out of reach. There have been too many false starts in their spiritual life. A lot of well-intentioned declarations of commitment puttered to stalls and stops. Humming under the hood is the belief a deep and satisfying prayer life is not for me. Do you believe that? I want you to know it is not true. A life of prayer full of joy, power, and awe is for you. It's not for other people. It's for you. And that's just in the introduction. There's a whole lot of good stuff there. That prayer is possible because God makes it possible from his end is a deep privilege. And I want us to feel this privilege today, that we can at any time and anywhere just trip into the presence of God, bolt straight into God's throne room with no introduction, no interference, no fanfare, no, no preparation, and start just talking mid-sentence with God. What a privilege. And that we can slow down and receive God's presence in prayer and take our time, sort out in prayer the jumble of inner conflicts, the tangle of emotions, the mixed motivations. What a privilege. And that we can pray together in worship, that we can pray with each other and for each other in worship. What a tremendously deep privilege. And I want you to feel today the privilege of prayer, especially corporate prayer in a worship setting. Have you ever counted the amount of times we pray in a worship service? We pray at the beginning a prayer of praise, an invitation to God to be present with us, to settle our thoughts and our hearts for worship. We pray in the middle over the offering, reminding ourselves of God's goodness and provision, even as we give these gifts to him. And then we pray in the middle again. This is a congregational prayer, which includes intercession, praying for others, and asking for ourselves, which is supplication. or asking for others. That's also supplication. Asking is supplication. We pray over world events for our global our outreach partners who are bringing the light of Jesus to needy, places all over the world. Each Sunday, we also pray for one of our children or youth, and it's really important to us to have them covered in our love and our prayers. 
Nowadays, when we don't actually pass a plate around, the two prayers for the offering and for the congregation are often back to back. And the lay leader ends the offering prayer, amen. And the next words from the pastor are, would you bow your head in prayer? Did you ever notice that you raise your head just to bow it again in prayer? And then we pray at the end of the sermon, a commitment prayer, an invitation prayer, welcoming God to do his work of transformation in us and through us. And then after the benediction, we encourage any who need further prayer, it used to be to come forward, but nowadays it's to wait in your pews and have someone come to you to have a small group prayer specific to what they are facing with either one or two people. And then on Communion Sunday, we had three more prayers. And sometimes we sing a prayer to God. That's a lot of praying, different kinds of praying. And even as those corporate prayers run the risk of becoming routine, it really should shout to us how much we truly value the connection we have to God through prayer. And how we do have to continually, throughout our time together, communicate intimately and directly with God through prayer. We need to pray with other believers. Jesus assures us that where two or three are gathered, what? There am I in the midst. And aren't you glad he said two? Aren't you glad he didn't see, say, well, where there has to be, let me see, 12. 12 is a good biblical number. Where 12 or more are gathered, there has to be a quorum. There am I in the midst. No, we rejoice that the promise of God's presence comes with a minimum of two praying together. Now, of course, I believe that his presence is assured to us when we pray alone. I think what Jesus was highlighting with that comment, with his two or three, is that we need each other when we pray, just as we need each other in order to grow spiritually. There is something fundamental, something foundational about praying with other followers of Jesus that we cannot do without. So I want to spend some time this morning thinking through the prayer, that prayer of at least two together with the foundational understanding that we need each other in prayer. Our passage today comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. We should know that these verses come immediately after the Apostle Paul had encouraged us as followers of Jesus to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power and to put on the whole armor of God. And then he goes on to describe the various pieces of the armor. The people he was writing to would have had in their mind the image of a Roman soldier. This whole passage is written in the plural to y'all as is most of the New Testament, I really regret that in English, the you can be either singular or plural because it masks the fact that most of the New Testament is written in the plural. We individualistic Americans usually read it as if it's talking just to us, only to us, as if we alone can walk our journey of faith. And it's helpful to remember that Paul is talking to us all together as the body of Christ. And especially in this passage, I suspect that as we visualize the whole armor of God, we are most often picturing one soldier with each piece of that armor identified or metaphorically identified. Here's me missing my helmet, of course, because I must let my long locks flow. But if you're a soldier, you are never alone. 
you depend on your fellow soldiers to your right and to your left, especially if a conflict arises. Soldiers are trained to look out for each other. And if I was a soldier, I'd most definitely be depending on the soldiers to the right and the left of me. I'd also like to have some other soldiers in front of me and behind me. The middle is where I'd be most comfortable so everyone can have my back, my front, and my side. It is no accident that immediately after describing the armor of God, the whole armor of God, and picturing a whole squadron of troops, it's no accident that the very next word that Paul writes is pray. And just as putting on the armor is necessary to our strength and power, so also prayer is necessary if we are to receive divine power. Our passage tells us that we must pray in the spirit in order for our prayers to communicate with God. Prayer is regularly described as the activity of the Holy Spirit in the believer. So here with this three phrase, three word phrase describing prayer in the spirit, I answer my own question. What even is prayer and how does it work? How is that gap bridged? God gives us his spirit which connects us back to the Father in prayer. We pray in dependency on the Spirit so that it isn't our thoughts, our words, our feelings that are carrying that prayer to the Father. It is God's Spirit carrying it back. It's very important that I do not pray in my own spirit because I know my own spirit to be faint and to be sagging. I don't trust my own spirit to be on the job every time I pray. I battle with my own spirit on the days when I'm distracted or when I'm down. And I need instead God's unflagging Holy Spirit to carry my prayers, no matter if they are strong or weak prayers. Verse 18 says, pray in the spirit at all times and in every prayer and supplication. And that pretty much tells us that every prayer we make needs to be in the Spirit. Why didn't Paul stop at every prayer? Why did he have to add supplication at all times and in every prayer and supplication? And in fact, why does he double down on supplication with the next phrase, the second half of verse 18? To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for the saints. Well, supplication is a very humble request. It's a petition. It's asking for something with humility in full knowledge of who we are and who God is. And we pray all kinds of prayers, prayers of thanksgiving come to mind, prayers of praise. But in how many of our praise do we ask God for something? That becomes a prayer of supplication then. What percentage of your prayers involve some kind of request? And for me, supplication is involved in practically everyone, almost. I ask a whole lot for myself. I ask a whole lot for others around me. That's called intercession, but it's also asking, which makes it a prayer of supplication. And this fact that supplication is built into probably over 90% of our prayers is, I think, one of the reasons why prayer is so vital to our Christian journey. I would like to suggest that supplication, it should dominate our prayers, that it's good and well that it dominates our prayers for these reasons. Prayers of supplication show our dependence upon and our faith in God. Those prayers connect us to God. We are to come before our Heavenly Father, some people say Heavenly Mother, if they prefer, as beloved children. And children ask for a lot. They ask for help, they ask for what they need, they ask for what they want. Children who are secure in the love of their parent know who is going to supply their needs and also some of their wants. So they go to the source directly. And when we pray in supplication, we are acknowledging the God of love as our source. 
the creator who is the head of our transformation, the father of lights who delights in his children from whom every good and perfect gift comes from above. A prayer of supplication honors God's greatness and our relationship of love and dependency to him as children to a father. Prayers of supplication allow us to share our lives with each other. Now in my family, we have been praying hard for my youngest daughter's next chapter in life. She's going to finish university um, in this year, in the summer, and she's applying to graduate uh, schools. And she's been very stressed out. <laughs> so for the program she wants to get in, to the schools have to interview her as a prospective student. So we've been praying each time she lands an interview. And sometimes we've been praying all day through on those days. So we got a family text from Elena and it says, another interview in 20 minutes. Another interview in 20 minutes. And it's followed by, you don't have to pray too hard because I don't really want to go there particularly bad. So she had applied to some safety schools and this was one of those. So then I texted back just a little prayer then. And then Lauren texted back, back LOL, I'm still praying. So big or small prayers, a little prayer or a really intense prayer, they add to the fabric of fellowship, to the fabric of koinonia, uh, our sharing with each other. And that strengthens all of us. Prayers of su supplication connect us then to God, but also connect us to each other. Paul doubled up on the supplication in verse 18 because his next verse was going to be a personal prayer request that he had. He needed their prayers. He was chained up in prison. He was facing a capital charge hanging over his head. It's interesting that he doesn't ask them to pray for his freedom. Instead, he asked them to pray for boldness in proclaiming the good news of Jesus. Paul needed their prayers to strengthen him. Have you ever needed somebody else's prayers? That's when you're really going through it. And maybe you felt sometime that you can't pray at all. That's when you really, really need it. Scripture assures us that we can rely on the Holy Spirit to intercede for us. And we can rely on each other. We need others to carry us when we can't take another step of faith ourselves. Prayers of supplication open our eyes beyond what we immediately want and alert us to the greater purposes of what God is doing. Prayer involves us in God's workings, God's activity. It involves us in bringing his kingdom down to earth as it is in heaven. And it is a wonderful an empowering thing to be a small part of what God is doing. Sometimes I pray for a specific request, but then I also ask God to apply my prayer to whatever area he wants to in that person's life. So I may be praying for their broken arm, totally unaware that they've got a broken heart which needs more prayer. I don't even know about that, but I have the honor and privilege of asking for God's intervention, for God's gifts on behalf of that person, and for God to apply my prayers as God sees fit. That involves me in the work that God is doing. Prayers of supplication can change our own heart and our own attitudes. They increase our faith. Now, I, every day I don't wake up thinking, my measure of health is a gift from God, I become aware when I'm sick that I need to turn to prayer. If I don't get well right away, that causes me to pray more, especially if I'm suffering, especially if doctors don't have the right answers. I ask and wonder what God is up to, and then I have to trust in God. 
that supplication works on my transformation. These are process prayers when we don't easily or immediately get what we ask for. It just means that God has more work to do in me. And it means so, so much to me to have others pray also. Most especially if it becomes a years-long prayer. Most especially if it becomes a lifelong prayer. We can give each other this gift as we sometimes will need it for ourselves. This support that followers of Christ can give that no one else can. Prayers of supplication increase our empathy and feed our love. Say you come to church rejoicing and in prayer time we're lamenting or vice versa. The corporate prayer of the day may not hit the mark every time, but it reminds us of our connections. It encourages us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep and that we can and should help carry each other's burdens. Our hearts are opened as we turn from our own nearsightedness, from just what is on our immediate agenda and mind, as we embrace others in prayer. Prayers of supplication discipline and transform us. They reorient our attitude. Have you ever prayed when you don't really feel like it? Have you ever prayed repetitively for a situation that doesn't seem to change? Have you ever prayed for someone you didn't like? Now that does a number on our hearts. All of that works on us. Those prayers of supplication work on us as much as they work on the other person. And through those prayers, God transforms us in patient, success-driven, immediate gratification-seeking, goal-oriented me gets changed when I bring that to God. And those prayers please God. So what really and what even is prayer? Prayer is a gift given by God through his Holy Spirit to connect himself to us and us to each other. And we have the tremendously deep privilege of giving the gift of prayer to ourselves, to others, and to God. And you, imperfect you, can have a life of prayer full of joy, power, and awe. A life of prayer is for you. So let's use our privilege right now. Let's do some praying right now. Can you bow your head with me? And first of all, pray a prayer for yourself. And now pray a prayer for someone else. And if someone doesn't come to your mind, ask God to bring someone to your mind. And commit this week to write a note or send a text or call that person just to let you, them know that you are praying. For them this week. Precious God, come to us in your prayers through your spirit and hear our prayers. Work through them. In Jesus' name, amen.
And now for the benediction, reading from Philippians chapter 4. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So may God's spirit rest on you in power. And may God's kingdom come and his will be done in your life and ripple outward in ever widening circles. Amen and amen.